webinar called Summer Camp Ideas. My name is Nan Baker Richardson and I am coming to you today from Salisbury, Maryland and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar and this is the last webinar in our spring series today. I would like to say a special thank you to our sponsors. We'd like to thank the National Piano Foundation, Music Teachers National Found Music Teachers National Association and also the National Association for Music Merchants for helping us to provide these free webinars across the year. Today we are very fortunate to have three presenters who have been teaching summer camps for some time. We have Lynette Barney from Arizona, Dorla Aparicio from Texas, and also Amy Perdue. This webinar will be recorded and it will be uploaded to pianonet.com so you're welcome to access it later on today and it will be available to you. The chat will also be available to you and as our presenters are discussing summer camp ideas if you have any questions you feel free to type those into the chat and we will be able to follow up with our presenters as they each finish their portion of today's webinar. So we will go ahead and get started. And our first presenter of the afternoon is Lynette Barney. Lynette, welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Nan. Hi, everybody. Good morning for me. It's only 1030 here in Arizona or good afternoon for all of you, wherever you may be. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. It always makes me nervous. Yay, it worked. Okay, so I'm here in sunny, uh, change that to hot, Tucson, Arizona. And I have been teaching in Tucson for, oh, close to 30 years. I think it's been about 27 years that I've been teaching here. And I currently support my family with my studio. So I have a full-time studio. It ranges from infants to adult students, but most of my students are between the ages of like five and 18. I have a handful of adult students. I have a music together, early childhood music program that's teeny tiny because of the pandemic. I have preschool um, group and kindergarten group lessons and then my piano uh, teaching structure that's a hybrid of group and um, private lesson that runs during the school year. So I have a lot of students of different ages and my primary motivations as a teacher are um, creativity and community. So summer camps are an absolutely perfect option to do those things. I am teaching probably 95% of my students in person. My parents overwhelmingly want their kids to be in the studio, the handful of kids still online. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what I do. It, you might think I'm crazy, but we have a lot of fun. So why would you wanna do summer stuff? Well, for a large studio like mine, and it being my only source of income, I need to teach year round. I don't want to teach for 10 months and then you know average it over 12. I want the continuous income, but I need a break. And my kids need a break, everybody needs a break. And so in the summer, I offer very flexible scheduling op options, but summer is required. I have a year round membership structure. And if you take the summer off, you basically have withdrawn from the studio and you go on the wait list. So I don't require practicing, don't have private lessons unless they pay for them as an add on. But what we do have is we have out of the ordinary memorable experiences. It's been fun this last week or two as I've been planning this, asking my students, what have your favorites been? So I even know what they are and I ranked them. They also build camaraderie and community. Now you might not be a fan of feet on your wall, but I love this picture because these kids are connecting. They're having so much fun and they are still friends, even though some of them have moved. Um, so those are my whys to have amazing experiences that they can talk about 
which by the way, they talk about with their friends. And sometimes that builds um, students on my wait list and have, have camaraderie and community. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, if I were a really structured person like my dear friend and colleague, Jennifer Fox, I would have a really good plan that I use every year, but I am not structured. And so I change it up every year, depending on my schedule, what my students, like what ages and stages they are. If I have a bunch of littles or a bunch of teens. So I mix it up every year. Um, I offer something I'll show you in a minute. It's a build your own camp because I have some families who want to do their whole summer commitment in a week. They want to be done. And then they don't want to see me again until August. And other families want to spread things out throughout the year. I mean, throughout the summer. And so I offer both options. They can add on private lessons, like I mentioned before, and they can invite people from the community. This is really fun. All of my workshops, well, not all of them, but the workshops are included in my membership, but they can invite a friend and that friend could pay for just that one workshop. So that increases my revenue, increases my community visibility, fills empty spots that might be in the schedule. Um, <clears throat> and just as a win-win all around. Most of my camp activities are for mixed ages and levels because parents want to bring their kids together and kids want a carpool with their friends. So I don't do a lot of stuff in the summer like um, playing a published ensemble together because it would be too hard to get all the right levels at the same time. So here's an example of how I might do a choose your own camp. I might teach three days in the week from nine to three and so i might have a little mini preschool piano camp so that'd be just the little bitty kids and then one day bucket drumming one day an instrument petting zoo one day piano dissection so one family might do just the instrument petting zoo and that's it because they're trying to spread things out over the summer and another family might sign up for everything except preschool they might sign up for all the 10 o'clock times all the lunch with the composer times and all the composition projects. And then they're done for the whole summer. So it's a little wonky scheduling wise, but I find because I'm a fairly laid back person, it works for me. So that's kind of an idea of what I do with scheduling. Okay, so super fun summer ideas. The ones your kids will talk about. I'll leave this up for just a minute in case you wanna jot anything down. Um, but these are the ones that the students ranked as their favorites. Everybody's hands down favorite was piano dissection, which is where we literally take apart a throwaway grand piano and a throwaway upright piano. And my new ones were just delivered on Thursday. We we're all very excited. Uh, next was multi-track recording, stop motion films, multimedia type stuff. We do a composition camp every couple years. They love anything where you can hit something like bucket drumming or things like that. Um, instrument, other instruments like pipe organ and an instrument petting zoo. Lunch with a composer is really fun. Let me tell you about this. I <clears throat> am really bad about giving myself breaks because if I give myself a break, I just work right through the break. And so it actually works really well for me to teach in a solid block and then be done. But in the summer, that meant I wasn't ever eating lunch, which is a poor choice. And so I decided since I would teach through my lunch break, I would just have lunch with my students. And then I would eat. They could have the longer summer camp experience if they wanted. And it worked great. So Lynette ate lunch. So it was again, a win-win. And that works really well online too. Last summer, my whole everything was online. Um, but this summer, I do plan to have lunch with a composer online so that kids can chime in um, and do that <clears throat> from home or in the studio. And I also love to have a kickoff piano camp for new beginners. And I'll tell you a little more about that. Okay. So because the number one favorite is the Piano Dissection Lab, I'll tell you about that first. This is 
such a popular event and it attracts a lot of community members as well. So I have in my backyard, now I have four pianos. <laughs> we gotta do something with the two that are taken apart. But um, there, my local piano store said they would drop off pianos they were gonna take to the dump as long as they didn't have to come pick them up. <laughs> so I'm stuck with them now. But um, what we did was my technician taught me how to very carefully pull the action out of my Kawhi Grand Piano. And only I do it. They can't touch it. They have to stand way, way back. But we actually look at it on a functioning piano. We look at how the keys work. We look at the complexity of the action. Um, we look at how the pedals work. It's really fun for them to see how the sostenuto pedal actually works. You have to pull the action to see that, by the way. And um, then they get to go outside and do everything we did on the pianos outside. There's an upright and a grand. So you can see them here in these pictures. They're playing around with a tuning thing. They're messing with the tuning pegs. They're taking off. They get to take off a hammer and action if they want and take it home with them. Um, I use resources from the Piano Technicians Guild. They have a lot of worksheets and information sheets that are awesome that the kids can do. We do the history of the piano. We read a book. It's over there. Can't remember what it's called, but I can look it up. And then we have a craft because, you know, you got to have a craft. And that's making these Kit Kat pianos. <clears throat> but I had a student once argue with me. He said, well, Mrs. Barney, um, really, since the piano, the piano's predecessor was a harpsichord and harpsichord keys are the opposite of piano keys, we should be able to make a harpsichord piano keyboard. So we do both now. So that's what we do. And it's a very self-directed activity. A lot of my summer activities are very self-directed. I'm around as a resource. The kids can go to older students as a resource but I do expect them to be fairly independent the older they are. If, it, if there's really little kids like kindergarten and first graders coming to piano dissection, I'll pair them up with an older student to be their buddy. So there you go, that's the piano dissection lab. This year, I think we're gonna plant flowers in the piano we already took apart, I think. Okay, what else have we done? Multimedia projects. This student is working on um, putting together her multimedia project, which was video that she recorded and audio and still images. So she's putting that together in GarageBand. And if we have time, I'll show you a couple of the multimedia projects kids have done. Uh, another thing we do is a six hour composition camp where at the end of it, they have a printed uh, piece of music that they can take home. They design the cover in Canva or they freehand draw it. They have to hand write the notation first and then they get to transfer it into note flight. And then they write a little biography. You can see that in the upper right uh, picture. There's a little biography. She wrote her biography and then we have a photo. And then I just printed out using my MTNA discount on 11 by 17 paper folded in half and they have their own beautiful piece of music that one's pretty popular too we have done uh go going to my church and learning how to play the pipe organ this is way fun especially when you can play the pedals sitting on the floor like the young man featured in the photo we've done an instrument petting zoo i have a lot of instruments most of which i play very badly and or don't play at all and so that's fun and also students will bring like if they play an instrument in band or orchestra they bring it and talk about it these are pictures from one of my beginning piano camps i love doing these because they learn so much i feel like they can learn kind of the equivalent of a whole semester of half hour private lessons because i have them as a captive audience for about six hours and so they can reinforce concepts and play games. Here you can see they have made, it's kind of hard to see, they're kind of small. They've made conducting batons out of pretzels and chocolates and they are practicing conducting each other. They're short. 
this was a young group and they were making a staff out of modeling clay and playing bingo so that's a super fun way to start piano couple more uh in the bottom corner we were doing bucket drumming and lego rhythms on the left these two kids were um, doing some improvisation and composing together. I love this picture, his scratching head. And in the upper right hand corner, we were doing a, it was like a first year piano camp. So not beginner beginners, but kids in their first or second year. And we were reviewing pentascales using marshmallows and chocolate chips. That was fun. All right. So I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Um, because I've got to turn my timer on. So I don't know if I have time to show you one of the multimedia videos or if we're ready to go to questions. I think you have time, Lynette. Okay, all right, then we'll share our screen. How do we share our screen? Zoom, no, no, not that one. Stop share, share screen. Okay, these were so much fun. So this one was done by a student who wasn't in my studio, he was a community student. He didn't have much music experience. He was a teenager, like maybe middle school. And he created his track with GarageBand and then did his um, stop motion video and sequenced it. I thought this was cool. Okay, I should have made that full screen, but I forgot. <laughs> Sometimes I get nervous. Um, let's see, the other one, well, there's so many fun ones I could show you, but <laughs> this is one of my all time favorites. So this kid, <laughs> I don't even need to explain, just enjoy. This was, we were doing something with silent movies. So we also watched a bunch of Charlie Chapman, the Chaplin things and stuff like that with the old silent movies. about that one is this child, he knew this piece of music, um, not as well as he should have because he never practiced, but he knew the piece and he created this whole idea around this piece. He, he, he added in the sound effects using the digital keyboards and laid it all out. It was super fun. 
For me, it's really important to give my kids a lot of latitude in the summer so that they can be creative where they're not trying to fit somebody's formula, but they get to explore things on their own with guidance and help. So there you go. That's some of what we do in the summer. Thank you so much, Lynette. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Balello, and I'm going to moderate just a few quest follow-up questions for Lynette before we move on to the, our next presenter. Um, Lynette, somebody asked about the book that you read um, about the piano. If you find yeah. that and you want to even just send it in the chat um, later, if you think of that, that was a question that I think we would all like to know. Um, Lynette, how many sessions do you require for your family to meet its summer commitment with you? Oh, heavens. I don't remember. Because <laughs> last summer, I let them do whatever. I let them come to everything because it was all on Zoom. So if they wanted to come to everything, they come to everything. Um, I think it's like about six hours of workshops per month. So 12 workshop hours and they can choose the hours, I think okay. is what I've done. All right, great. And then one other question, what curriculum do you use for your beginner piano kids? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I, I really have use a hybrid. I use Piano Safari, I use Music Tree, I use um, Nicola Canton's Vibrant Music Teachers, Mini Musicians, um, I use a lot. I, I just do whatever I feel like. We just have fun. Okay, great. Thank you, Lynette. There are some other questions if you want to read through them on the chat um, and you could send some of your answers on the chat. And next we're gonna go to um, the next person, Dorla Aparicio. And we're gonna welcome her for her portion of this presentation. So thank you, Lynette, and welcome you. Dorla. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and share this here. Oh, just a minute, please. Okay. I hope you can see that okay. Um, all right. So I am going to talk to you a little bit about summer music camps that you can use for any instrument. I am a piano teacher in Texas, and I mainly teach group piano lessons and a few uh, private lessons. But I love talking to teachers about group piano and about piano camps. What I'm going to give you today is information you can use right away for any instrument that you are teaching. And before I forget, I want to invite you to join our free Facebook group. Uh, it's called Let's Talk Group Piano. And a lot of teachers are there giving ideas about piano camps and about group piano. So what I like to do in one of my piano camps is mix music and science. And the whole point is for us to learn how to discover the harmony between music, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and then on the piano part or on your instrumental part, we learn and discover uh, creative ways to play your instrument. And I will be doing this this summer with eight, ages between four and 14. So the benefits are for specifically for private lessons um, in that you don't have to change your schedule. And that's what's gonna help me out this summer is that I'm, my schedule is going to stay the same for everyone. And I'm going to adapt this music camp to whatever we're doing or to whatever the schedule is in the summer. So it will be eight weeks, once a week. I'm gonna adapt it for each level. I won't have to hire help like I've done for some of my bigger piano camps. And so there's um, going to be a little more flexibility in scheduling because um, whatever plans the parents have for their family, um, whatever I've worked in for makeups or coming on a different day to make it work, it's already set for them. What's really exciting is that the content will change every week, keeping that theme of music and science. For You can also do it for your group lessons. Now, the traditional piano camp will be where you have a schedule maybe for five days, 
two hours each day and you provide them with a snack or you can just do three days three hours each day and they bring their own lunch um, or you can do once a month club and just get together for an hour or more to go over your theme and my tuition always stay the same for each of these scenarios I also would encourage you to do your music camp online and I like to talk about these three models that um, work really well so the block hours model could be just for one week and you get together for three hours online and you would use this mostly for your older students that can stay that long online and do your piano camp um, you can also uh, do the split hour model where you meet for an hour with the students give them something to work on during a break and then the evening you can meet again where they can show what they worked on you do some more musical activities and then you're done so that works well with your younger uh, children and then the monthly piano club model also works well online and tuition stays the same so i've done this with um these different age groups i do a preschool piano class that is four to seven elementary i divide between eight and eleven and middle school eight to fourteen i have not done it with older than 14 usually that age group i have them as helpers and so they would be teachers um, if we're doing some type of a rotation in our summer camp okay so how much should you charge? This is always a big question. And so what I always say is figure out all your expenses. Maybe if you have to pay rent or if you have to um, pay for help, um, if you're buying a curriculum, if you're not creating it yourself, how much will it cost? And if there are any additional materials that you will need, are you providing snacks? All of that you'll have to take into account. Um, and then number two is, do you want to volunteer or do you want to make a profit? Um, a lot of the times we end up thinking we're making a profit, but really we're just being volunteers, volunteering our time and our knowledge. So decide that upfront, what you want to do. What I do is I charge the same rate as regular tuition. So just like Lynette, I have a, um, a type of a membership, or I call it all inclusive. So my families play the same and pay the same amount every month. So in the summer, the, I already know how much they're going to pay. They're required to come for the whole summer. Um, if it's a one week piano camp, that would cover one month of their tuition for one week of activities. Um, as I mentioned before, this week, th I'm sorry, this summer we're doing the same come once a week like you normally do. And um, I have a free piano camp budget planner for you. So if you just go to my website, mistorla.com, you'll see on the, the free resources, you can just download it and it breaks down for you what things you need to think about and how to um, increase that, how many students you need, in order to make a profit if that's what you want marketing i'm so terrible at marketing i always forget i just started talking about my summer program yesterday because i was making these slides and i thought oh no i haven't been doing what i always suggest to do so i know how that is but this is how we will spread the word start today tell everyone in your social media in your emails start doing that in the reminders the students get for weekly lessons put in a little note to remind them what's going on just get a little buzz going in your studio i use my piano cams for retention so if you need it to bring in new students you have to do even more and then word of mouth is like the best and it's free so start doing that now 
Okay, so how are you going to mix music and science for the lessons? So I know some of you are thinking, I, science, I'm not a science teacher, I can't do this. But yes, you can, and it's a lot of fun. So here's how I've related music to science. We talk about the water cycle. What, what, what in the water cycle? Well, there's patterns in the water cycle and there's patterns in music. Electricity, make a new invention. Show how electricity can work with music. And one of the best ways is making a banana piano. Uh, some of you have already used a makey makey before. And that's what I use. It's always awesome to do that. Sound waves. Um, if you're using a grand piano, you can look inside the piano and see the vibrations, but also um, learn about how the vocal cords vibrate to make the sound, how our eardrums, and there's videos on this and um, just different ways that they can learn Oh, this is all related of how we listen, how we make music. Math. Oh, there's intervals, there's well-tempered um, instruments, all of that. And then there's different uh, math equations that are very simple for you to learn how to do, but also to share with your students. Light refraction and bending. So when you bend light, did you know that you could also bend the sounds? So if you have woodwind instruments, string instruments, but how would you bend the sound on the piano? That's fascinating for the kids to know how to do that. And then density. I use density to talk about um, dissonance and consonance. And then you can uh, just do little experiments with that. That is always fun. And then the music lesson, what are we going to do? How are we going to incorporate a piano lesson with this? Well, I have my students play by ear and I don't require my piano students to have a certain skill level. I mix them all together. So playing by ear is an awesome way to do this. Also, if they, for those who know a little bit more about piano, they can play from lead sheets. The 12 bar blues is an excellent way that you can introduce everyone to play together because some can play that progression in chords, some can play the blue scales and some can improvise. Or you can add repertoire that is appropriate. And there's music by Wendy Stevens. There is um, music from the piano safari uh, method that is only for rope playing and you can make that work for everybody. And then the fun part, you can do games, music, I mean, movement activities, experiments are always going to be a favorite when you're doing music and science. I don't know if worksheets are gonna be fun, but I like to use worksheets to review the things that we've learned in science and in music. And then for the younger ones, then I use coloring pages for them to take home and be able to share with their family what they learned. I think my next slide is a video of a short experiment. Um, sometimes it's a little bit too loud, so I'm just warning you right now because it comes on right away. Okay, just a little snippet of this soft explosion. It looks very simple and it is simple to do. You just need hydrogen peroxide, dish soap and yeast. We did this with a lesson on dynamics, but you can just imagine if the kids are not really sure what's gonna happen and you go through the process of telling them what to do, what to pour, and you've already made that um, learn that concept of dynamics going from quiet to loud doing a crescendo or a diminuendo and then you do this 
you can just imagine they are so excited to do this and this is very simple to do the experiments that you um, incorporate do not have to be difficult and these are things that we all probably have at home all right so how do i do this in a 30-minute private lesson and um planning you have to plan everything so choose your experiments gather your materials have everything ready and your worksheets and games and videos make sure you know exactly what you're going to do and so here you see i've listed you want to do your science lesson your music lesson your experiment and then choose either game video or worksheet and that is how you'll make it fit for your 30 minute private lesson if you're doing 90 minutes or more for a group lesson either online or in person you can do all of this you'll have enough time okay now if you're doing it online you're going to want to prepare uh, your piano camp box so you'll have to go through your activities and see what will work best for them to have at home already and you send that to them in a package and then when you get together online then they already have those things ready also send a list to the parents so they can know what household items they will need to have besides the piano or the instrument and that always helps to keep everything organized for your online lesson so i have another resource for you if you are barely now planning what you're going to do for piano camp or for your music camp it doesn't have to be for piano i have a 30-day plan to piano camp it's free on my website and that will take you day by day to help you plan with marketing, with getting your curriculum ready from day 30 to day one of your piano camp. And I believe that is all that I have. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to share. Thanks, Miss Doyle. That was really great. Lots of fun ideas. And I think the um, inclusion of Science is wonderful for, for summer ideas. Um, so a couple of questions for you. Some of these are just my questions too. <laughs> so um, what resources would you recommend teachers buy if they're just getting started for the summer camp um, experience? Like what, what are your, your major go-tos that you tend to use year in, year out? Oh, good question. And um, I'm a little biased here because I do have piano camps that I have created and that I have for sale. So I have um, under the sea piano camp that is for preschool. I have a musical STEM piano camp that is for ages seven through 11. And everything that I've talked about here is already um, planned out for you with all the materials and everything. I also have one similar to what Lynette has uh, with dissecting the piano. It's not for you to dissect the piano, but learning about the piano inside, even though I learned so many ideas from her. Um, but those are the resources that I use. And what I found is that um, I use them over and over again. So this music and science, the musical STEM one, I used three or four years ago. And I'm bringing him back and the kids are like, oh, I remember. So we do it over again. So that's always fun. Great. Um, one of the questions that, that I'm seeing in the chat box, do you have an experiment for Forte? For Forte? Oh, I can't remember all of the, all the experiments we do, but um, I, I, I don't. I don't. Not, not that I, that comes to mind right now. <laughs> That's a good if question. If you think of one, you can, you can post it in the chat box for us. Yes. Um, do you accept other teachers students to your summer camp so if any local teachers oh. that... so that has never happened to me because i do not advertise um, locally or even in my city at all because my piano camps are for i use them primarily for retention so if students bring friends in that's okay but i've never had that um I don't, I don't know if I, I think I would um, because I am not teaching them really like a certain method. We're doing 
stuff that you normally don't do during the school year. So yes. Great, thank you. And one last one for you before we move on to our next presenter. When you are doing your online camps, mm -hmm. what are your expectations for parent participation, especially when we are doing experiments? Yes, so I craft a whole um, email for them so they can know what I expect from them. And one of them is to be in the, in the same, how about being at home? And with an earshot in case there is anything um, they need to do with the, uh, the digital part of it. The experiments, the experiments that we do are very, very low key, um, that the children are not gonna get cut or burn or anything like that. So, you know, as long as the parent is close by, it's gonna be okay. Thanks, Ms. Doyle. There are a couple of other questions in the chat box if okay. you are willing to go through and answer those for us. That okay. Would be awesome. Right. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to our next fabulous presenter, Ms. Amy. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy. I own Music Center Studios. We are located in Boise, Idaho, and I'll just give you a quick idea of what we do so that as I'm talking about our summer programs, you can kind of put it in the context of how it might relate to your studio and what you do. We have two locations here in the Boise area, uh, usually about 12 teachers and about 300 students. So um, a little bit on the larger side, maybe, you know, if you're teaching out of your home with 20 or 30 kids, um, some of what I say might be a little bit different for you and your um, circumstances. So we offer kinder music classes. So that's our baby and toddler program for newborns through about the age of four. And then we use Alfred's Music for Little Mozarts for our preschoolers. So that's our four to six year old program. And after that, we move into piano, guitar, violin, voice, um, all of those lessons. And then we also enjoy our adult students. And I feel like adults always kind of a broad word. We like to group our adults ideally when we have enough to have groups of like 20 to 30 year olds, and then maybe like moms groups or retiree groups. So adults, but still kind of you know broken up into different age groups and we are primarily a group lesson studio so um we all of those you know obviously kinder music is a, a group uh setting but our piano lessons our guitar violin voice all of that our adults we love to group our students that way and um a lot of our lessons too, I would say, are on the recreational music making side, uh, where that's definitely a focus of our studio. So the way we format it is each of our, for piano, each of our teaching rooms has five pianos in it. And we've got a teacher on one piano. And so that means we'll take four students, uh, same age, same level in a class, and they come once a week to an hour long lesson. So that's kind of how we're set up. That's how we run um, our September through June lessons. Um, so, We've been offering summer camps here in the Boise area for over 20 years now, so quite a while. It's funny how time passes. Um, and a few things that I wanted to share with you guys, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen here. Let's see. Oh, give me a second. Hold on one sec. Here we go. Okay, so just some quick tips that I was thinking of um, as um, I was thinking about what might be helpful to share people with people as they're thinking about summer offerings. One thing that I've definitely noticed over the 20 years that we've been doing this is that families' interests and needs shift. Definitely, you know, um, what our local families are looking for has changed over the years. A, a couple of examples that come to mind are that our musical theater camps used to be a huge hit every summer. Oh my goodness, we could offer several sessions. They would all fill. It was, you know, half a day for five days a week. We'd do a, a present our musical theater production at the end of the week at the library. That would bring in other families because they were seeing what we were doing at the library. And it was great. It was a huge money maker for us for years. And then as our area has grown, fortunately, and it's a good thing, we actually now have two different local children's theaters. 
which is great. I'm glad they're in town. However, it completely wiped out our um, musical theater offerings because, you know, we don't have that background. We're music teachers and guitar teachers doing it as a fun summer thing, and they're actually dedicated musical theater people. So um, another example is we were sort of early in the whole STEM uh, excitement and I happen to have a, a brother who's an amazing STEM specialist for elementary schools and so as soon as that kind of became a thing we got him in on the summer times we were offering these amazing STEM camps I'm um, like Dorla mentioned the the bananas and the pianos and all of that and it was great for a couple of years well then the YMCA caught on to the fact that STEM was a really big thing and now our local YMCA offers this huge summer STEM program and again that wiped us out um so again Again, just looking back over the years, there have been things that have been great certain years, and then, you know, things shift and change in the community and what's popular and what's not popular. So we shift with that. Um, also, another thing that I think is important to remember is that sometimes in our educator and our music minds, what we think is going to be really great isn't necessarily what our eight and nine year olds think is going to be great. So an example of that is I have a wonderful teacher. Um, she's from Alaska, she's Native American. And one of her specialties in college was sort of ethnic drumming and different cultures. And she had the opportunity to travel all throughout Africa for a year and learn all about different drumming. And so her and I put together this amazing summer camp. It was going to be such a great opportunity for our kids to learn about world cultures and drumming. Nobody signed up, <laughs> but we put something like princess sing along <laughs> on, on the schedule and you know every little eight and nine year old wants to come. So again, it's not always as educators what we think is going to be really beneficial for our students, but just what's going to bring people in. Um, so that's something to think about too. And then the last thing I have down there, and this has been touched on a little bit also, kind of what Dorla was saying, charge what you're worth. One summer camp that's really fun that we do every once in a while is sort of a music and art um, camp. And one year we did that with a backyard theme. So the idea was sort of like the big public parks that have music installations where the kids can walk around and explore different music things. We did that on a smaller scale for backyards. So, you know, uh, wind chimes made out of spoons and giant xylophones that they could mount on their fences and stuff. And the teacher I put in charge of that did fantastic. She came up with the most am amazing things, but I wasn't strict enough with her budget and it really was just kind of a break even camp. So again, like Darla was saying, are you just volunteering your time or do you actually wanna make money? Um, so that's an example of when we did not do a very good job of planning our budget and, and sticking with it. So charge what you're worth. I often find that um, if I, I, I think I know what price we should charge and I can usually go even higher than that and people are just signing up and they're like, oh, great, that sounds perfect. So I, I maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I think I have a, a tendency to undervalue what we do. So make sure you're not doing that to yourself. All right. So those are just some little fun things that, you know, I thought it would be good to share. Um, but now a little bit more specifics. And again, we're a larger studio. So, you know, to get 12 of us all organized and planned and stuff, we have to start early. So we actually, as soon as the holidays are over, that's when we have our big teacher meeting for uh, our summer plans. We start in January and everybody has the opportunity to think about what appeals to them, what they would like to offer that summer. We start working on the schedule and the camp descriptions. And then we, um, our goal is usually to have everything ready by March 1st. And so that means by March, we've um, gone to our summer page of our website, which we only have live for certain months of the year. And, and like after August, you know, we hide that page. Um, so we update that and get it ready to go on March. Um, we also always um, order a bunch of brochures. That's a big part of how we get the word out. Um, so 
I just order scads and scads and scads of brochures. And then once you've spent the money on the brochures, you want to get your money's worth. So one thing we do is we sit down with all of our students in the month of March. They put the little brochure in front of them with highlighters or red pencils. And we have our teachers get the students super excited about what we're offering that summer. And we have them highlight it or circle it. And then they take that little brochure home to mom and dad and they say, oh, this is what I want to do this summer. And it's funny on my end as the registrations come in, I I can almost tell which teachers did a really good job getting their students excited because those are the camps that are filling up and filling up. Um, so other things that we use those brochures for, we pass them out at all of our local music stores. We ask them to keep a little stack of them on their countertops. We have good relationships with some of our local elementary schools. So, um, and some of the music teachers within those elementary schools. So we ask them to keep um, handfuls of those uh, laying around for when people are asking them we have good relationships with several of the other businesses in our shopping center that we're in. So we'll kind of trade, you know, oh, I, I go to the bakery that everybody in town loves and they give me some of their coupons and I give them some of our brochures, that kind of a thing. Um, so yeah, we just, once we've paid for those brochures and we order, like I said, lots and lots and lots of them, we try to get them all out around town. Um, our website gets a fair amount of traffic, so we're lucky to bring in people that way. And you're welcome to go to our website. It's musiccenterstudios.com, and you can just click on our summer page there and see the different things that we're offering this summer. We use social media a lot, and that's kind of interesting because in years past, like I said, looking back, you know, over 20 years, we used to spend quite a bit of money on print advertising. So things like our local parents' guides and, and local little, you know, parent magazines and stuff, we really don't spend money like that anymore to get the word out because now we have got so many different ways to distribute that information for free. So certainly things like the Nextdoor app, we use Hula Frog sometimes, and of course, you know, things like Facebook and Instagram. And then we also are lucky, we've been sending out monthly newsletters, you know, for over a decade. And so the amount of people that's on that newsletter list is, is very large now. And it's always funny, you know, you get a registration come in from a family you had eight years ago, but in the meantime, they've had more kids or something. And, and you didn't even realize they've still been reading your newsletter all these years, but uh, that can be a great way to bring um, people back into. And then of course, referrals, that's our favorite, right? So so that's just kind of how we go about planning our summer camps and how we advertise for them. Here's just a few fun ideas of things that we've done over the years. Um, we like to bring in guest teachers sometimes, so that can be really fun. Musical theater, like I said, was, was really big for us for a couple of years. Um, Noteworthy is a fantastic camp that we offer every year. The students actually do not play any instruments in that camp. We just strictly work on note reading. That one's wonderful. Um, we always offer a band jam and we make that kind of special by just um, offering it to our older students, our teenagers and middle schoolers. So the young kids kind of get excited for when it's their turn to get to come to band camp. Um, musical escape room is one we've been having a lot of fun with for the past couple of years. And then we really like to bring in new students during the summertime. So Beginner Bonanza is a camp that we've developed. That's a really big one for us. Here's just some pictures. Um, this is when we used to do musical theater and you can see it was very just, you know, sort of homemade. Um, uh, you can see why now that we actually have uh, children's theaters here in town that <laughs> um, they've taken that over. But I wanted to share with uh, you about our beginner Bonanza camps. We decided to go with a superhero theme and our kiddos come and they get a little binder like this. And basically, I was tired of, you know, starting kids for a couple weeks in a Faber primer or an Alfred primer, but then September would come and because we're group lessons, they might have new kids in their groups and then how did I take the kids that had already had some summer lessons and put them in with the new kids. So we just wrote a fairly simple like little six week curriculum. It covers all of the sort of black key, finger number, high, low, loud, soft type of things that you want beginners to start learning. Um, the songs are super simple. Like I said, they're just black key songs. They all have this little superhero theme. Um, we incorporate cute little games. It's super easy on like Oriental Trading Company. You can buy these little masks that the kids get to color one day. 
or they can just simply use popsicle sticks to make little superhero puppets. So simple things, but it's super fun and the kids love it. So then they've had this great six week introduction and we get them super excited. So they think piano is just, and actually I say piano because I'm a piano teacher, but we offer this for guitar and violin also. Um, and, you know, after doing that in the summer, of course they want to keep going when September comes because they've had a great time in superhero camp. So it's a really great way for us to um to bring in new students we stop opening our schedule to new students in March. So anybody that, that calls March, April, May is going to get funneled into one of our beginner bonanza camps. And then that sets us up great for September when we also have more new families calling. Um, we can incorporate those beginner bonanza kids in with the new kids and that gives us a great start to September. Here's just a couple of pictures of our silly little kiddos uh, with their superhero masks on. And these are some of our kids in noteworthy camp. So this is the one where they don't actually play the piano at all. They're just working on note reading skills. We, we start and we give them a quiz at the beginning of the camp and they get a score for how many flashcards they could answer. And then they come to the camp and at the end of the camp, we finish with a little quiz. And of course their score is totally you know, shot up. They get to take a little certificate home to mom and dad that shows how much they improved. And the kids just think they're playing games the whole time. So they have a fantastic time and noteworthy, but really from an education standpoint, it's, it's one of the best ones that we offer. So we love summer programs at Music Center Studios. It's a really big, important part of our offering and what we do. It keeps our current fingers, our current students' fingers moving over the summertime, which is always important. Um, it's great for group lessons because we take that break from the method book and they just get a chance to work on other things like the musical escape room is really fun. Um, and... Um, the new kids love being a bonanza, so they're all excited to keep going with piano. And for us, because we have two different commercial locations that we're having to pay rent for, obviously that's a super important part of summer programs for us. And then it just gives us a chance to do fun things outside of the method books. So yeah, we love summer camps at Music Center Studios. Thank you so much, Amy, for just great ideas. Um, we're just right at the end for today. I'm going to pull maybe one or two quick questions from the chat. Um, do you have an example of your musical escape room or maybe a resource or a website for that? Anything? Yeah, anything? I don't. It's just all things that we came up with. Um, so we, we purchased a bunch of little fedora hats and magnifying glasses and um, uh, what's it called? Invisible ink pens. Uh, we, we found little decoders. And so we've kind of created this whole script of there's this mystery that the kids need to solve, but they have to learn their song perfectly to earn their next clue to go to the next level. <laughs> but it's all just stuff that we've kind of come up with. So I don't have any resources to share for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That has actually been a theme from all three of our presenters today that I've noticed that a lot of your camps, it's uh, things that everyone has created, um, which is which is interesting. All right, Amy, one last question. How do you distribute your newsletter? Is it an email or by email? Yes, yeah. We use MailChimp. Um, so we've been using that for years. And, and like I said, that list you know, of subscribers has just gotten really large over the years. So MailChimp works well for us. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you to our three fabulous presenters today, Amy and Dorla and Lynette. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to pass this off to Richard Rahino, who will close our session for today. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. What a great exchange of ideas. I'm just struck by the openness and the generosity of today's speakers and all our speakers uh, to be uh, so giving of their time and talent, their resources and everything that they do in their studios. So I wanna thank uh, our speakers today as well as all of our speakers that we've had all year uh, for really helping us launch uh, a really great set of webinars. Um, and which brings me to the point that, um, you know, these webinars were or are brought to you by the National Piano Foundation in partnership with MTNA. And we are grateful to MTNA for helping us um, 
get our information out and for being able to invite uh, the MTNA membership. So thank you to them. Also, I wanna thank NAM, the National Association for Music Merchants, uh, who helps us with our funding. Um, we apply to them every year for grants that allows us to put on these webinars to offer scholarships to the RMM track at uh, MTNA Pedagogy Saturday and to do other things uh, that, to help raise public awareness of music education through the piano and the keyboard. So a big thank you to them. And I also wanna thank uh, uh, our committee, uh, Nan, Rebecca and Emily who worked hard all year uh, not only to bring and put together these webinars, but also the RMM track, uh, which was, a, uh, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to see it, but it's really another uh, testament to uh, their commitment to bringing you the best speakers and content uh, regarding RMM. So thank you to them. Um, and lastly, I wanna say that um, I hope you all will keep an eye out for the fall. We're gonna continue these uh, webinars into the fall of this year and the spring of 2022. And I uh, hope that uh, you continue to find value in what we bring you. So with that, I wanna wish all of you a great summer and I hope your students and continue to flourish and that you all have time for a little break and that uh, relief from the pandemic is, is not too far off. So thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.